Well, Borodar, good morning, everybody. My name's John, and I have got a great topic for you this morning. Rachel asked me uh, a few weeks ago to, to speak on wickedness, rebellion, and sin. For those of you wondering, uh, well, the context of all this, maybe you've uh, not been following um, the gatherings online over recent weeks. We've been looking through Exodus, and I want to thank Amy last week for for going through Exodus 34, 6 and talking about the character of God, and for Rachel and for John and Karen for how well they've uh, walked us through some other chapters in Exodus over the last few weeks. But as I say, my topic this morning is wickedness, rebellion, and sin. It's from Exodus 34, verse 7. And it says this in that verse, I forgive, it's talking about God, wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Now I'm gonna be uh, honest with you this morning. I'm going to cheat because I'm going to talk to you um, about one of those words. It's the smallest of those words. In fact, it's only three letters. I'm going to focus on sin this morning. And I'm going to particularly focus on sin because one, it is, it is such an important concept to grasp, but also I believe it's, a, it's an idea, it's a word that uh, is so misunderstood, particularly in these modern times. You see, I believe the, the world views the sin, the word sin, often in the wrong way. I don't blame them. It's uh, not a commonly used word. It's probably seen today as old fashioned and, and maybe irrelevant by some. Even a word maybe to be mocked. The understanding of the word for most people is all about thou shalt not. When the word sin comes to mind, immediately it's, it's about restriction. A restrictive word. A word that's associated with killjoys to, to make people feel bad. I'm sure that many people see the word sin as applying to, to somebody else, you know, the, the people down the road, or, or maybe the bad people of history, which I'm sure we can ream a few off. I suppose what I'm trying to say is that in our culture, we're not always good at understanding the true meaning of sin. And the fact that each of us are sinful beings by default if we have no framework for this word sin, then we don't understand the need for a saviour to forgive us. We don't, if we don't understand sin, see the need for Jesus. So many people in our culture today believe in, in God or, or a divine creator, they may call him, but not Jesus. Because they don't understand the need for the cross and forgiveness, because they don't see themselves as, as bad people. So what is the biblical meaning of the word sin? Well, to understand it, I believe we need to look at uh, the root words. And uh, in the Old Testament, sin, the word used for sin is katar, a Hebrew word. And the definition of katar is to fail or, or miss the mark. And to put that in some kind of context, um, the word Qatar was also used in Judges uh, chapter 20, if you, if you want to look it up. There in chapter 20, we're told that uh, there was a group of 700 men in the army of Israel. And these 700 men were from the tribe of Benjamin, and they were crack shots with a sling. The sling was an important weapon in armies of that era. And it's said that those 700 men could hit a hare with their slingshot. I'll read the passage. It says this. 
Among all those men, there were 700 who were left-handed. Each of them could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And the word there is katar, the same word that's used for sin. They could not miss, and the word miss is katar. In Proverbs, we also see the word katar, not in the context of sin, but in the context of of going the wrong way. In Proverbs 19, uh, verse 2, it says this, Getting excited about something without knowledge isn't good. It's even worse to be in a hurry and miss Qatar the way. So as you can see in this context, Qatar was used in the context of, of missing the way. So to fail or to miss the mark. In the New Testament, the, the language there used uh, for the written form is Greek. And sin there is referred to as hamartia. And hamartia, the definition there, is tragic flaw. I like the, uh, the definition that's uh, given in the dictionary for hamartia. It says this, hamartia is another term for a tragic flaw. Heroes in literary works often have hamartia or a tragic flaw that leads to their downfall. And that sums up for us, really. This hamartia, this, this sin that leads to, sadly, our downfall. So in the Bible, the true meaning of sin isn't thou shalt not, but instead it really means to miss the mark, to miss the true path. A tragic flaw. Or to sum it up in, in one short definition, sin is the failure to fulfill a goal. So you might be saying to yourself, okay, John, that's great. I've got a def definition of sin, but why is it important? Well, I want to refer to um, a little part of the famous Christian apologist C.S. Lewis book. He wrote a book called The Abolition of Man, and he compiles a series of sayings uh, from the different world religions in the back of it to show when it comes to behavior that religions ask and demand and urge upon us. Um, there's almost complete uniformity and, and universal consensus in what they, they ask of people. Most of them, or, or all of them, suggest we, we're not supposed to lie. They all say we're not supposed to, to break our promises. They also say that theft is wrong and that murdering each other is bad. They, they tend to suggest that respecting each other is an important aspect of life. We're supposed to live with justice and equity. We're supposed to live by the golden rule. Treat others as you would want to be treated yourself. We're supposed to be generous with our possessions. There are several of these things in every religion. Everybody understands that we should live that way. There's universal consensus that we should live that way. And yet, of course, we know that the main reason, the main reason for all the misery in the world is that we don't live that way. The main reason for all the problems of our society is because people don't live that way. Now, when everybody agrees what we should be do doing, it's right there. There's no doubt. And everybody agrees that the reason that we are miserable is because we're not doing it. Here's the question. What is there about the human heart? What is there about the human condition that we can know exactly what we should do? We can even know the consequences of not doing it. And yet we do it. Over and over and over again. No matter what kind of government, whether it's Labour, whether it's Conservative, 
whether it's plight, whether it's fascism or communism, whether it's democratic or republican, no matter what kind of therapy, no matter what we do, all the trends, all the philosophies that come and they go, we all still do the same things. We know what we should do. We know the consequences and we do them anyway. How do you explain that? Give me an explanation. The Bible's explanation is that the human heart is sinful. But beyond that, we are slaves to sin. Sin, the Bible tells us, is not just an action. It's power. Let me put it to you this way. A sinful action is a power. Every sinful action has a suicidal destructive power upon the faculty that puts that action forth. In other words, when you sin with the mind, that sin shrivels the rationality. When you sin with the heart and the emotion, that sin shrivels the emotions. When you sin with the will, that sin destroys and dissolves your willpower and your self-control. Sin is the suicidal action of the self against itself. Sin destroys freedom. Sin is an enslaving power. Sin shrivels us up. You see it as Moses leads the people through the desert time and again. In the book of Numbers, in, in chapter 4, the children of Israel start to moan about the food. We had a wonderful time in Egypt. Let's go back. This isn't the only time they say that. As you know, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And through God and through Moses and the leadership and the goodness of God and Moses, they've been led out so they're no longer political captives. They're no longer slaves socially, politically or economically. And yet, at many times, this isn't the only place. This isn't just one of the most, this is sorry, just one of the most memorable. They say, we had it better in Egypt. Why don't we go back to Egypt? We want the comforts of Egypt and the civilization of Egypt. We want to go back. Now, any reader reading this looks at that and says, what idiots, what total idiots. How in the world can they remember they got free fish in Egypt and say, Remember the fish was without cost. You see that? Without cost. Yeah, it was free. You were slaves. They were slaughtering your children. They were whipping you. They were saying, make bricks without straw. Go on, get on with it. Of course the fish was free. I mean, what rational person looks and says, well, there was an upside. I mean, the fish was free. I mean, they fed us. How in the world can you think about free fish and say, let's go back there and select out, forget all those other things? You say, what idiots, what fools. Don't they know if they went back now, they would only be treated even worse. They might even be punished by total annihilation. But the only right thing for them to do was to stick with the manner that they were given freely. It's not as appetizing as it was, maybe, but that's their only option. And go forward to the promised land. It's so clear what needs to be done when you're looking from the outside. Any fool can see what needs to be done. And yet they see what needs to be done. It's very clear they don't do it. Even more than that, they can't do it. They won't do it. They don't do it. Why? Well, because they're slaves. Not maybe economic slaves, but spiritual slaves. You see, think about it for a moment. To be a political slave or an economic slave, it means you're powerless economically or powerless politically to do what's best for you. 
You might know, for example, that the best thing for me to do is not make bricks, but to be a painter. But if you're a slave, you don't have the political or economic freedom. You're powerless to do what, be, what would be the best use of your gifts. You're powerless to do what's best for you. You're powerless to do the good things for you, right? But you see, these children of Israel have been removed from the political and economical slavery. But there's a more profound sense of slavery. There's a more profound kind of slavery. And what is it? They're spiritually powerless to do the right thing. They're spiritually powerless to do what's best for them. They're spiritually powerless to do what's good. And the Bible says every human being on the face of the earth is spiritual slave in some way. Paul, for example, puts it this way. In Romans 7, a very, very famous passage. And remember, this is St. Paul saying this. He is the St. Paul. And yet he says, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So I find it to be a principle that when I most want to do good, evil is with me. I am sold as a slave under sin. Now that's St. Paul. Do you hear that? He says, I found a principle that's more, more I want to do good, the less I am able to do it. The more I try to do good, the more I see I am unable, powerless to do what is good. Now, if somebody out there says, well, that's not my experience. I've never felt anything like that. This is overstatement. This is, this is preacherly hyperbole. You see, I have never experienced the powerlessness to do good. I can do the good when I see it. But didn't you hear what Paul said? Paul says, the more I try, the more I aspire, the more I am aware of my spiritual slavery. Which means if you're not aware of being a spiritual slave, probably your moral ambition is too low. Time and again, we see this power in the Bible. But not only there, it's all around us. I think the statistics for, for failed marriages are, are about 50% of marriages uh, end in divorce. Yet I wonder what percentage of, of people, as they, as they declare their vows to one another, actually plan on later breaking up and divorcing one another. That's just one example. There's so many in the society around us where things that we, we know we want to do and, and maybe even determined at that particular time to do them, you know, we can't follow them through. I've got a confession to make. I love a good history documentary. What really fascinates me is how ordinary people can end up doing crazy, um, often obviously wicked things when they start out with such grand and noble aims. The French Revolution, for example, is, is characterized by three words, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. In 1791, at the start of uh, the French Revolution, they, they gathered together and discussed how, how unfair it was to have capital punishment and how maybe it should be banned. Yet within a year or two of that debate, those same people who were declaring liberty, equality and brotherhood were going through the, the reign of terror when when thousands upon thousands of people were guillotined and, and killed. How does that happen? And then in the 20th century, um, the countries that, that became communist and, and ruled, or so they, they started off thinking, for each according to their ability, for each according to their needs, grand and, and noble statements, 
But those same countries that embraced that ideal ended up killing millions of people. In Russia alone, nine million people of their own people killed. China under Mao, it's estimated over 40 million people died. How does that happen? You see, a fail sin is a failure to be truly human. In the Bible, it shows us that most of the time people are failing and they don't even know it. Or even worse, they think they are succeeding. When Pharaoh made the Israelites slaves, he persuaded himself he was doing it for the greater economic good, I'm sure. When he told them to, to make bricks without straw, which is almost impossible, he was maybe doing a great thing for Egypt in terms of saving them money. But it still had terrible consequences. Sin is more than just doing bad things. It's about how we deceive ourselves into redefining our bad decisions into good ones. Have you ever done that? Why are we such bad judges of moral failure and success? The story of Cain and Abel at the beginning of the Bible gives us some insight. In it, it says this, if you don't choose what's right, Qatar, sin is crouching at the door. It describes sin as a wild beast crouching at the door, waiting to pounce. Failed human behavior, our tendency to self-deception, I believe are rooted in three things. See, each of us tends to act out of selfish desires and urges. Secondly, we tend to act, even if we justify it otherwise, we tend to have a, act for our own benefits when left to our own devices. And we tend as well, thirdly, to act at the expense of others. In the New Testament, Paul describes Amartya as a power or a force that rules humans. In Romans 6, 6, it says, we are slaves to sin. Slay, a sin, sorry, lives in us. Then again, Paul says in Romans 7, 15 and 16, the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. Sin is our failure to fully love God and others. It's our inability to judge if we are succeeding or failing. We have a deep selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. It's not a pretty picture of ourselves, but to be honest, it's realistic. This is why the story of Jesus is such good news and why we still have hope. Jesus is depicted in the Bible as the creator who became truly human, who did not fail to love God and others. In other words, he didn't sin. He didn't Qatar. He didn't Hamartia. Yet, despite this, he took responsibility for humanity's history of failure. He lived for others and died for their sins. And then when he rose from the dead, he covered for their failures. I love the final, this final passage that I'm going to share with you now. It's in 1 Peter, it's in the second chapter, and it's verses 22 to 24. It says this, he committed no sin, Yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. That's a fantastic passage, a passage of hope. And that is the biblical story behind the word sin. 
I want to thank you for, for listening this morning. And I hope some of that um, is something you can take away and think about in this next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.